So welcome everyone. Dave, thanks so much for the introduction. Um, in the next 30 minutes, I'm going to be talking about three main topics. One is we're going to talk about elevating customer experiences through haptics. Secondly, I want to look at the market and talk a little bit about why we think the adoption of advanced haptic technologies is actually slower than it should be. And last but not least, we're going to look at Lofeld, a technology company that is focused on standardizing the approach uh, to realistic haptics. Now, before we dive into this, I wanted to ask um, how many of you have an iPhone 8, 9, X, 11, anything higher than an iPhone 8? Good. So I want to do a short live demo at the end of this talk. So if you have an iPhone with iOS 13, please go to the App Store while I do the presentation and download the Lofeld Composer. It's a free app. Um, it's very small. It shouldn't take too long. Now, let's talk about elevating customer experiences. Um, for us, haptics, the value of haptics today is all about realistic experiences. And what's a little bit bizarre for us is if you think about the haptic technology, um, I would say one of the devices that really made haptics widespread is the Motorola Pager that got introduced in 1994, which really just had a single purpose. It vibrated on your belt when you had to return a call. Now, in the year 2019, it feels like the majority of the devices are still using the same technology that was basically pushed out in 1994 in the Motorola Pager. So things have really not moved forward that much. The Motorola Pager also had a display, but display technologies actually have significantly improved. So just to give you one example, this is a car game from the 80s. I guess you know, some of you might remember this, um, called OutRun. And this is the equivalent of 2019. So you can see visual technologies, audio technologies have massively improved and have given us basically a level of realism that is absolutely amazing. Now on haptics, we're still basically dealing with rumbling vibration, mostly driven by an ERM motor that can really only do on or off. Now, before we dive deeper into how we can solve this, um, I want to quickly shine some light on some of the use cases that we think are, I would say, like the killer applications that we can deliver around uh, realism. So one of them, very straightforward, is gaming, right? So this is a, a, a soccer game uh, called FIFA. And imagine, as a player, you could actually feel um, your avatar running on grass. You could feel someone bumping into you. You could feel the player kicking a ball. I mean, this is the kind of level of realism that I would expect in haptics in 2019. Another use case that is really um, interesting for us is social media. Why social media? Because haptics is one of the rare sort of technologies that can create a sense of proximity. If something touches you, it means it's close by. And in social media, I think this is one of the things that when you're, when you're um, communicating with your friends, you're losing that sense of proximity. And haptics is one of the few things that can actually bring that back. Now, an interesting challenge in social media is um, if you want to have haptic experiences in social media, like say Instagram stories or Snapchat, you need to be able to deal with user-generated content. We just heard the talk from Marcelo who talked about like, uh, the, the role of the haptic designer. If you deal with social media, there is no haptic designer because the end user, the person uploading content, is not a haptic designer. So there needs to be some process to create haptics uh, without um, having a designer involved. Now, looking forward actually into, into what's available in the market today. So we already have a few products on the market um, with, with partner companies that um, um, ship products with low technology. One of them is Racer. So this is the Nari Ultimate. It's already available in, in, um, in different uh, configurations for PC gaming, for Xbox. And the Racer Nari comes with uh, what we call Lofeld Wave. It's a technology that converts audio from a game into haptics in real time. So you can get a sense of, of realism in gaming without needing content integration. Another one that I also really like is, actually I actually have one here, it's this thing here, it's called Teenage Engineering OPZ. So Teenage Engineering, for those who don't know it, um, it's a, a boutique synthesizer brand from Sweden. They create these little digital instruments, they're amazing, you can tag them along, take them along, uh, make music anywhere you want. And so, as I basically, you can't feel it now, I can feel it. So as I, as I make music on this device, I can actually feel the instrument, like it's a real instrument. I can feel the bass, I can feel the resonances. And we've had amazing user feedback on this where people are just saying like, once you take that thing out, once you take the haptics away again, the machine becomes lifeless. It's almost like taking the soul out of the instrument. So what does it then actually need 
to create realistic haptics. And um, this is kind of how we look at the ecosystem. There are three main stakeholders involved. Foremost, the end user, because that is the person that wants to have a good experience, right? Um, and they're going to be using different devices, could be a laptop, a mobile device, accessories, game controllers. And um, they don't really want to worry about switching between, between devices and, and not having a certain experience being consistent. There's the content developer. They create the experience. So their interest is in having tools that can actually, that allow them to create haptic experiences. And more importantly, that haptic experience needs to translate across the different devices. And then there's the hardware brand uh, with hardware and embedded developers. And their interest in, is in building devices that can actually deliver the experience that is being designed by the content creator. So it's actually a pretty straightforward setup. The problem that we have today in the industry is that there is a very fragmented space and very little connection between the content developer and the hardware brand, uh, meaning there are no real standardized APIs or anything like that in the market right now that actually allow us, the, the haptic community, to build these things. So again, if you look at this more as a block diagram, a little bit more abstract, I think what we need is basically a consistent um, haptic pipeline that has three main elements. There is the design side on the left side. So you need in intuitive design tools. And um, in our case, our focus is on using audio as a semantic for design. And on the delivery side, you need um, a playback device that can um, deliver the haptic experience. Uh, which means you need to have um, a, hardware, a hardware agnostic drive solution. And in our case, we're also developing actuators um, for, for the delivery point. And in between, you need an API that is basically translating the information from the content to the delivery point. I'm going to actually get a little bit more into the details of this in a little bit. Before we go there, I want to actually take a quick step back or sidetrack into another question, which is why is the market actually so slow in adopting solutions like this? And the interesting, actually, no, I'm not, I'm not going to give you the conclusion right now. So uh, we, what we've done is we've basically um, talked with our business development team about all the feedback that we're getting from customers if or when a project doesn't materialize in production. And we also went out and talked to basically some of you in the industry and asked, like, what is you uh, holding back? What is holding you back uh, to, you know, ship your technology in, in, in products? There are three reasons. One is... It's the higher cost versus the return on, uh, on the investment. So we all know that new haptic technology, no matter how you build it, it's going to be more expensive than an ERM. It's just a matter of fact. Because ERMs have been around for 10, 20 years. They're really highly optimized for cost. And it's, I would doubt that there's anyone out here that can build something cheaper than an ERM. That's not a problem in itself, as long as we can actually um, prove that there's also value in actually moving from an ERM to a much better haptic technology to create realism or whatever. The problem quite often is that in this decision process at some of these larger brands, there will be some business unit manager that will ask the hard question, which is, if I put this technology in my device, how many more will I sell? What's the impact on my shareholders? And this is a question that I think most of us cannot answer today. Number two, there is no industry standard for vibrotactile feedback. The problem is we're trying to pitch something that is better, but when is it actually good enough? When, where is the threshold where we can say, okay, now we have better haptic feedback than we had before? Uh, some companies um, use the term HD haptics, um, like Nintendo, Sony, uh, Valve. The problem is it's a marketing term. There's no quantifiable data behind what is actually HD haptics. And I think this creates a lot of uncertainty also in, in, um, in the market around so I'm paying for something, but I'm not actually sure what it is. And the third problem is that there is a very opaque pattern in licensing space. So this is something that basically holds both innovators and customers back from adopting haptic technologies. And again, it's just a lot of concerns around, uh, around this and, and, and how to deal with it. So there's one really interesting conclusion in this, which is competition isn't our problem. So from all the deals that we had that didn't go through, there was not a single one where the customer said, I'm going to take the other company's solution because they're cheaper, better, whatever. Competition isn't a problem. In most cases, the haptic experience just doesn't come to market because the company decides it's too complex, it's too costly, or some other concerns that they didn't want to deal with. Which raises this interesting question, so what can we do? So what can we as a haptic community of innovators basically do? Because I believe that we're basically all in the same boat. I feel like haptics is a huge market 
we're still stuck in technology that's 30 years old. And if we actually move the market towards using better technologies, we will all benefit from that. So here are three sort of suggestions or things that we've started to initiate um, to, to try to move things forward. One is to have an open agnostic drive solution. So Lowfeld, from our perspective, we've started to develop at first a closed system. So we had software, we had actuators. You needed to have both. You need to have the software to drive the actuator um, and, and vice versa. And we've seen that this is actually a big problem because we can possibly make something that fits all use cases. We don't have the actuators that go into device XY that has a triangle shape. I don't know. There's so much stuff out there that we just can't cover. And I think it's, uh, it's, we should be thinking much more about working together and building an ecosystem where you know, our software could also drive someone else's actuator um, and not worry about whether that's a, a piezo or a voice call motor. In the nutshell, I would say the, the, the widespread adoption will be faster if we actually have innovative systems that are more open. Second point is standardize the approach to quality. The big problem around HD haptics being a marketing term and not really having quantifiable data is something that we can easily resolve. And so what we've done here as a first step is that we've actually quantified this um, in something that we call VT1 right now. It's a, just a term for vibrotactile um, feedback for realistic um, experiences. And I'm going to talk about this a little bit more again in, the, in, in a minute. Um, and we see this really as an open, non-proprietary suggestion. So we, as Lofert, were not in a position where we can dictate what standard the market should use, but we can at least make a proposal and see if you agree, if you disagree, and also if you disagree, we'd love to hear why and, and how we can improve it. And the third point on the IP, so again, what is the opposite of having closed proprietary IP around opaque um, uh, licensing terms? It's to open it up and make a very clear, very straightforward uh, licensing um, 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 uh, proposal. And one of the ways to do this is to open source your software. So what we're currently in the process of doing is open sourcing all the key bottlenecks in the API and also have them run under a, an open um, source uh, licensing um, agreement. Basically with the idea that it should be as simple as possible and as transparent as possible for any company to start experimenting with the technology. If you have to go through 15 meetings of business development and sign agreements and you know, get some closed software that you can't really control or see what it's doing, it's just really going to slow things down. And I feel having, having part of this um, ecosystem open sourced will really speed up the adoption. Now let's take a quick look at the standards. So um, unfortunately it's not online yet. I have copies here. So we have 10 copies with us um, that we'd like to share and show to you and get your feedback on it. So let me quickly maybe you know, say a few words of what this actually is and, and why we're doing it. The idea here is to have an open and non-proprietary standard. I think the best way forward is that there's no single company owning a standard, but having something that we as a community of, of haptic innovators basically agree on. And um, we, the main, I would say the main goal of this standard is to replace subjectivity with objectivity. So we need to have ways to measure things accurately and not just assume um, or, or you know, have vague terms, terms around it. We want to define the what, not the how. This is important. So we're not saying you have to use actuator X, Y, Z. We're not saying you have to use a piezo or a voice call motor. This is completely open to the customer. It's all about what does the delivery system deliver at the end of the day. And then we're also providing very clearly defined test methods. So this is also a big part of it. Like, you know, quantifiable data is only valuable if you all agree on how you um, achieve that data, which means we have to really look at that, um, the, the test method. And one of the examples, um, I want to give you one example, we are defining this standard or this specification on the delivery point. So we're not looking at the perceptual side of the human brain, of the skin, um, frequency response and things like that. We're just looking at, okay, you have a device, let's say a smartphone, and this is your delivery point. This is where we're measuring the standard. Let me give you just a really quick, um, simple example. Let's take the dynamic range as an example. So we believe to get to realistic haptic uh, experiences, you need to have, one of the things you need to have is a dynamic range. The problem in most mobile phones today is, that brands, especially in the Android space, are putting in an actuator that is barely strong enough to vibrate the phone in your pocket. So you have to basically drive the actuator at its maximum resonant frequency for it to vibrate in your pocket and then you feel what's going on. But um, 
it's not an actuator, it's not, it's, the system it's itself doesn't have enough dynamic range to actually create haptic experiences that deliver something like a footstep or a paper surface or a collision, because for that you really need um, a dynamic range. So what we're doing in our specification is to define why do we need a dynamic range, uh, the underlying reasoning, we're looking at what is the limitation of the ba basically the basic haptic technology that we had before to kind of show why we're, we have a need to, to change the specification from what we had before. Then the actual specification. So we could say, for example, you need to have a dynamic range from X to Y uh, under these conditions, and then also describe how we're measuring those. In this case, um, what's interesting is, uh, I mean, you, you, I, I'm talking to a group of haptic experts, so you, all, you probably know a, a big part of this, but if you attach an actuator to a mass, the output force will basically go down because a lot of the force is being absorbed, absorbed by the system. So you have, what we've uh, identified is you have a perceptual threshold, so if the force is, underneath, uh, is lower than a certain um, uh, amount, then your skin doesn't really feel anything, right? So you need to stay above the perception threshold and then to the upward limit, I mean, there is no real upward limit, but you need to make sure that when you add mass, when you add a big phone or when you add an actuator into a big phone, that the actuator is powerful enough to have enough dynamic range between the lower perception threshold and what it's maximum uh, capable of. Anyway, it's a little bit easier to understand um, when reading it, and I said that we have some numbers here. This is still a work in progress, but we wanted to bring an early version of the specification, share with some of you, and again, just get your feedback and see whether, whether you think we're on the right track here. Next, I'm going to pick up actually the, the talk from Marcello earlier on and talk about haptic becoming uh, part of the experience design. So when we launched the Razer headphone, for example, um, this does not include haptic experience design. It's a headphone that really only takes the audio in from the game and converts it into haptics in real time and tries to do as good of a job as possible, like limiting background noise, doing a whole bunch of DSP on the signal. This is, I would say, only as good as it gets for real-time haptics. You, if, you want, if you really want a perfect haptic experience that really ties into the game experience or whatever content experience that someone is creating, you need to enable the creators basically to take control over the experience. And we also saw that there are very, very few or close to none haptic experience design tools out there. And there isn't really even an agreed on semantic for haptic design. Like what, what is haptic design? You know, is it something that is visually based? Is it sound based? Is it something completely different? And so with the launch of Core Haptics um, a couple months ago by Apple, we actually took the initiative, because that basically gave us 500 million devices to play with. It um, um, gave us the initiative to just roll out uh, some of our concept in something that we call Lofit Composer. It's right now just running in a web browser. So you can go to composer.lofit.com, open the web browser, uh, you can drag in an audio file into the composer, it uploads it to the cloud, does the DSP analysis, brings the haptic data back, visualizes it, and then the important thing is you can actually, through a QR code, pair your phone to the editor, and as you edit, you can test it or preview it in real time. Because the interesting thing about haptic design is how do you, how do you feel what you're designing, right? If you're designing on a laptop, the laptop doesn't have haptic feedback, so you always need to design something blind and then put it in your game, compile the game, put it on the phone, and then test it. And it's a really long and, and cumbersome process, and it's not intuitive. It's not fun, and I think it's not creating good output. So with something like a phone paired to the editor, you can immediately try things as, um, as, they, as you're designing them. Another interesting angle on the haptic experience design is um, We've seen this over and over again from content creators. They don't want to design over and over again for different platforms, devices. And again, Marcello, you mentioned this already in your talk about the Android space. So Android is a good example because it's a completely fragmented space with tons of different actuators, different systems. Very, very hard to predict what's going to happen on the phone, which basically means people aren't really designing haptics because you can't. Um, so in our system that we're developing, um, we put a lot of effort into the translation process that can go into making the experience not the same, but somewhat consistent across different platforms, even across different ecosystems. Right now, our SDK runs, I mean, obviously we have our own platform uh, where we can uh, try things, but it also runs on iOS using Apple's Core Haptics, and we have integration right now also with Android. 
with Windows, Unity, uh, Audio Kinetic Wise. So there are all, a whole range of platforms, sorry, that we can immediately integrate in and ship value to the end user if we want to. Last but not least, I also want to mention that we're still building actuators. I mean, this is something that most people actually know us for because it was the first thing. That's kind of where Lofil started. Um, we right now have three um, main categories of actuators, the L3, L5, L7, which is very straightforward. So the L3 is more around like wearables, mobile devices, small accessories, AR, VR. Um, L5 is sort of like for bigger, like hand controllers, headphones. And then the L7, which is, I would say, the main application that we have there is um, a big game controller. So it's roughly the size of an ERM that you find in today's PlayStation 4 uh, DualShock controller. But it can also go into automotive, for example, car seats and things like that. Um, again, just to remind you, this is, this is an, a range of actuators that we offer, but our solution is not tied to these actuators. So we, we intentionally said, look, this is something we are, of course we are supporting our actuators, but we're also working with other um, actuator manufacturers and want to expand uh, that ecosystem because we will never be able, as a single company, we will never be able to build all the actuators required by the industry to fulfill all the needs of the different form factors, price ranges, and, and so forth. So to quickly recap, again, it's all about the ecosystem, but the way we see this, our future vision of the ecosystem is an open one where we basically bring innovation in and we make it work with things that other people have created. I think the worst thing that can happen in this industry is that we start to build little fragmented um, proprietary solutions that don't work together because again, at the end of the day, it's gonna create a fragmented market space and it's just gonna stop adoption. And that's, I think, a huge problem for haptic experiences. So, I shared a few insights now into what's happening at Lowfeld. Um, and again, we're gonna be here today and tomorrow. I'm gonna hear, I'm here with Charlie, one of my colleagues, and Nikhil. We have the specification here. We'd love to hear your thoughts. Uh, we're really open. We wanna hear you know, how we together can move the industry forward to actually adopt better haptic technologies, because I think that is one of the underlying problems that we all share. And I think once we are there, we can still worry about competition and other things like that. Now, um, who has Composer running on their phone? So um, if you open Composer, I just want to give a quick example. This is around like haptic experience design and how we envision this to translate not only iPhones, but then also Android phones and many, many other devices in the future. If you open the app, um, make sure you have the sound turned on um, because haptics, as we all know, is, a, is best in a multimodal context. So if you have at least the sound and haptics, it's great. If you have the visuals on top, that's even better. But if you only have haptics, it's often a little bit um, difficult for your brain to actually digest what's going on. In Composer, you have the four buttons um, where you can try um, the car engine, a heartbeat, a kung fu scene from Kill Bill, and a piece of music. And now if you click here on the camera icon, uh, you can scan a QR code. And if you now scan this QR code here, you have your phone connected to the editor. I'm seeing a few phones going up. I hope it works from the distance. Yeah, you have the QR code? <laughs> <laughs> so let me switch over then to Composer. So this is how Composer looks like. Um, it's running, in the, oh, sorry, this is now the wrong screen. I'm gonna bring it over. So this is how Composer looks like. It's basically just a browser window. Um, again, you can drag any audio file into it. If you've scanned the QR code successfully, you should be feeling a basketball game. So this is a, a sound, the sound of a basketball game. Sorry, I'm managing two screens here. One moment. Yes, I can hear the basketball game. Now, uh, if I just take another audio file, so here's, for example, a car. Uh, one moment. Ah, it's not playing the audio now. So this is a, a car sound. I'm just dragging it in. You can see how it's being uploaded. Um, it's generating the pattern. And you see both the waveform and uh, the data. In this case, so it's, it's four core haptics, so we're a little bit limited by the API that Apple has given us. 
So it's mostly amplitude and sharpness envelopes and transients. Transients are not visualized here right now, but you can basically switch between the two curves. And I hear the, it, it works successfully to sync to your phone. So the moment you drag in a new sound file and the new data is generated, it immediately syncs to your phone and you can immediately try it out. Once you're done, once you're happy with the experience, you just go to this red button down here and click Copy Ahab. You copy paste that into your Xcode project and you're done. And then you can compile it with your app. So there is no easier way to do this right now. And the nice thing is, so something like the car engine, it would require you about 400 lines of data to write manually to get to that experience. And this is something that, I mean, we were already now in touch. Since launching this, we had a lot of influx from iOS developers that, that said, thank you, thank you for giving us this tool because it saves us so much time. It's so much more creative. Um, and again, this is just the tip of the iceberg. We already have a version running on Android. Um, if you find us after the keynote, I can give you a quick demo. Um, and we're going to also slowly roll this out in more platforms and um, also expand, of course, on the functionality of Composer. Thank you.